an original MCM production. And now we're ready to go to the next part of our program this morning, which is, of course, our panel. We are, we are very fortunate to have such an illustrious, well-informed, conscientious, mindful, intelligent, and wise group this morning. I'm so happy that they saw fit to come and bless us with their knowledge. We're going to take maybe 12, 13 minutes per person. Uh, you know, you can go a little bit more, a little less, um, but uh, I brought this in case you go too far. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. <laughs> uh, first we have uh, Professor Robert S. Smith. He is Associate Professor of History at UW-Milwaukee and is the Director of the Cultures and Communities Program and Associate Vice Chancellor for Global Inclusion and Engagement for UWM. His research and teaching considers the intersection of race and law. He is an author, scholar, and researcher. He's also a father. Uh, he teaches courses on African American history, the history of African Americans and the law, as well as courses on United States legal history. I am pleased to say that he has presented at brainstorming many times over the years and always brings it straight, no chaser. <laughs> Professor Rob Smith. Good morning, good morning. Get the microphone here. Uh, it's indeed a, a pleasure to be here this morning. It's always great to be here uh, at the breakfast to talk about these important issues. Uh, what I'll do today is offer some historicizing for the questions about and around not only voting, but uh, voting rights, political participation more broadly. And I'd like to start with several framing statements that I think we're all very aware of, of and, and, and certainly clear about. But for our purposes of the panel, I think it's really critical for us to have these as, as some framing uh, ideas. First of which is that voting, voting rights, political participation, all of that included uh, broadly is indeed one of the key cornerstones to citizenship. We know that. The, the engagement with the political process is indeed a key and core component to fundamental questions of citizenship. And therefore, access to the political process and having some control over politics is one thing to have access, is another thing to be able to exert some kind of control and power provides citizens the ability to dictate the, to the terms of that citizenship, you know, so that indeed engaging in the political process and having, to, having the ability to have some sort of stake and say also allows for us to then determine what citizenship ought to mean. And third, I'd just like to say that, and I'll, I'll highlight that limiting access to the political process, whether that's through redistricting, uh, voter ID laws ultimately restricts the rights and responsibilities of meaningful citizenship. Certainly there is a core and important landmark Supreme Court decision that talks about the, the ability to cast a meaningful vote, uh, to, to cast a vote that actually has an impact and has some sort of say and some sort of matter. And what I'll do today is, uh, I, I'll, for number one, I'll be mindful of my time. The last time I was here, I got scolded. I went on a little too long and I don't want to get in trouble this morning. Um, so I'll make sure to keep my comments as close to that 12-minute frame as possible. What I'd like to do is go through some key historical vignettes that really inform how we got to the place that we're here today and that continually inform the importance of, around, uh, of, of how voting and political participation have been central to citizenships and uh, questions of citizenship, but then also uh, the way that access to the political process gets manipulated in a way to essentially maintain complete and total uh, control over uh, various populations at various moments in American history. And I have to go back to Colonial Virginia. I have to begin my conversation there because it is Colonial Virginia that teaches the rest of the colonies and ultimately what becomes the United States how to shape a system 
fundamentally about and around racial control, which is directly connected to economic control. The system of race, the system of racism that we are continually having to navigate and fight through had its genesis in colonial Virginia. The system of slavery doesn't actually emerge in the early 1600s. It takes several decades for that system to emerge. And part of the process of slavery emerging also means that the system of racism, racism is emerging alongside it. And politics and political participation are directly connected to that process. And what I'd like to do is go back to a moment in 1676. And many of us have probably heard about Bacon's Rebellion. You may have heard that from a history class or two. Bacon, Bacon's Rebellion sets a tone there in the late 17th century that will forever then become part of our political landscape. Bacon's Rebellion was this unique moment where black, white, and indigenous folks who were in many respects part of the same socioeconomic status. They were the laboring classes. Some may have owned a little bit of land if they had gotten the opportunity to move out of indentured contracts. But fundamentally, there was this moment in the late, the late 17th century where black, white, and indigenous folks gathered together to resist the power structure in colonial Virginia. Colonial Virginia was certainly the seminal colony in the shaping of what would become the United States. Part of what this particular group of uh, rebels sought to do was increase and expand their own economic and political rights. They banded together in opposition of uh, the almost complete control that the landed elite was able to uh, uh, articulate and amass over the several decades as the, the colony is forming. And what happens next is very critical to our conversation today. The power structure in colonial Virginia says very clearly and, and very directly that it has to destroy and get rid of this cross-racial class-based alliance. That alliance essentially was going to destabilize the power structure there in colonial Virginia. And it does so by then moving into two specific areas, one of which is the system of human bondage becomes significantly advanced and functionally based on race. It's by the 1660s and the 1670s that the system of uh, race-based slavery starts to grow and expand and almost outpace the numbers of indentured servants. And so race-based slavery becomes the target effort in terms of controlling the labor population as a response to uh, weakening this alliance amongst white, black, and indigenous uh, workers. The next effort in response to Bacon's rebellion was to advance the political rights of those marginalized white rebels. And this is very critical. What happens, of course, is the leadership in colonial Virginia grants these folks voting rights. And the African-based population is denied voting rights. The access to the political process even in the beginnings of our nation, the ability to control and manipulate that process signals the defining sort of character of how race becomes a part of and connected to the political process. As early as the 1700s, 17th century and then into the 1700s, we see this process taking form and taking shape. Now for many of us, and this will move me to my next point, for many of us, we think uh, early on about the, the United States as addressing this fundamental question of representation around the three-fifths clause in the United States Constitution. Now, of course, what we often do is we, we leave the three-fifths clause as a statement about and around um, the, the limited ideas or the limited sense of humanity that is bestowed upon Africans or those or who, who are enslaved. And for today's purposes, we need to move a little bit farther than that to make the, the necessary connections around how important, how, long, how important and how long standing these challenges have been. And what I'd like to do is to remind us of Article One, Section Two of the Constitution. We've got a law, uh, law, a law professor here and some judges, so there might be a, a quiz or some Socratic method after this that we'll have to address. <laughs> Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to the respective numbers which shall be determined by adding the whole number of free persons, 
right? And we assume that that whole number of free persons is in direct, uh, a direct statement about uh, white Americans or emerging white Americans at the moment, but there were free blacks, and we have to remember that. There were free blacks who took part in the pro political process, including those bound to service for a term, which is obviously a direct statement in regards to indentured servants, excluding Indians not taxed as a result of the various ways in which uh, sovereignty was being played out amongst and with native populations. And then we get that infamous clause, three-fifths of all other persons. Three-fifths of all other persons. Now, of course, this is not in any way to suggest that that does not uh, shape the sense of humanity and inhumanity that uh, is, is connected to the system of slavery. But it's important for us to be even more astute about what that three-fifths clause meant by looking into the debates that informed it. The, 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 the language three-fifths is not, does not emerge from the, the kinds of nefarious roots that uh, we would anticipate, even though the outcomes itself are certainly nefarious. The, the number, the, the, the formula, is uh, in many respects about how slaveholding states and non-slaveholding states were negotiating representation in the House. And of course, if you happen to own a whole range of millions of people who you don't grant rights, it would certainly benefit you as a political body to count them as whole people. In this historical irony, it was southern states who were actually arguing for enslaved people to be counted as whole persons, which in some respects, in many respects, gives up the goods. If indeed southern elite, southern political elite, were willing to count enslaved people as whole persons for political representation, then obviously they knew they were human, right? Obviously they knew fundamentally that that person mattered, and that person specifically mattered to the body politic, right? So as much as that three-fifths clause does present this very infamous moment in America's political history, the stories behind it reveal this, this long-standing practice of manipulating and attempting to control the political process in an effort to maintain and, and certainly expand and control what was right supremacy as the nation is beginning to uh, emerge and form. But if we move a little bit further, if we move further several decades and get into the era of Reconstruction, we also see some very important continuities and some important challenges emerging. From 1865, at the moment of emancipation through 1870, we saw what was indeed a constitutional revolution. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments fundamentally reshaped the, the nation and uh, certainly reshaped our nation's interactions to, with one another and reshaped what we began to understand in reference to constitutional privileges, constitutionally backed privileges, and our, our fundamental understandings of what it means to be a citizen. Upon emancipation, certainly with the 13th Amendment, again, uh, several years later with the ratification of the 14th Amendment, those who were formerly enslaved did what we would expect folks to do upon the eradication of that system. They began to act like free people, right? They began to reunite families. They began to create their own institutions. They hungrily and aggressively sought education. And for our purposes today, they began to vote. Black men began to vote in extraordinarily high numbers, and they fundamentally began to reshape local politics, state politics, and to some degree, politics in DC. And this is a very important moment in America's first experiment with racial democracy. It's the first time that the United States has to grapple with these realities. Obviously, the, the overwhelming majority of African Americans were in the south of the United States. And as a result, in the 1860s, two southern states, Mississippi and South Carolina, had black majorities. Other southern states had significant black populations that could very easily peak upwards near 45, 46, 47 percent. The actions of being engaged in the political process sought to redefine race and power relationships in the south of the United States and then ultimately across the country. Because of this emerging political power block that was African Americans you know, engaging in the political process for the first time, the elections of, 18, of the 1860s, 
in the 1870s were quite possibly the most violent times in our nation's history. In fact, uh, it, it's hard to determine the level of violence and the extent of the violence because records are uh, constantly being examined and reviewed and questioned to get a sense of what that meant. And, and the reason I raised this particular point is that indeed, alongside the other various mechanisms to disfranchise African Americans, violence, quite honestly, political terror, political terrorism was in many respects the chief weapon used to make sure indeed that there was this uh, continual control over politics um, on, the, on the part of white Southerners specifically. And it's important for us to just take a step back and, and, and talk about things very simply. When you control politics, you control other people, right? And when you are unable to engage in the political process, you are, un, you are then incapable of, incapable of protecting yourself against that power. And if you are not a part of the political process, those who have political power don't have to in any way think about, be concerned about, or extend any consideration to your needs whatsoever. And so this was, in many respects, the linchpin uh, of the Jim Crow era. The Jim Crow era was held together. The system of legal segregation was held together because there was complete political control on the part of the solid democratic South, a system that completely removed African Americans from the political process. Certainly, violence continued to be a part of that measure and a, and a part of that process, but uh, the, the ability to control the political process, either through outright violence, grandfather clauses, literacy tests, uh, what are some of the other mechanisms? Poll taxes, you know, all of those mechanisms were significant in maintaining control over the, over the political community in the South, such that folks could not then interrupt that process. Folks could not then intervene in the political process to therefore change and reshape that process. And so from 1865 through the latter parts of the 19th century, as the system of Jim Crow emerges, it is indeed this fundamental control over the political process that allows for that system to maintain. And in fact, I'll, I'll leave with one other uh, comment here, then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, the 15th Amendment is really important for us to, to, to remember doesn't actually confer the right to vote. The 15th Amendment makes room for and allows for a whole range of mechanisms to emerge because the 15th Amendment just says you can't deny someone the right to vote on account of race, color, previous condition of servitude. And so as we think about the mechanisms that have been a part either of our constitution, of our, our, our state politics, uh, of our various federal level, uh, politics and political jockeying at the federal level, these various forms of man manipulation, these various forms of control are still with us. They have a long-standing history. Certainly, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is still one of the most important pieces of legislation this uh, country has ever embarked upon because it redefined political power. It redefined the political power structure. And so this history, indeed, moves us into a moment in 1965 where we then see this complete and uh, uh, utter return and reignition and reigniting of African Americans into the political process. So I'll wrap up there and I'll answer any questions later. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, next we have Representative Frederick P. Kessler. And he is the state legislative representative for the 12th Assembly District. He was elected to this office, at least on the most recent occasion, in 2004, after serving previously in 1960 and again from 1964 to 1970, sandwiching in a career as judge some 11 years or so. He is also a former president and board member of the Milwaukee ACLU and Amnesty International and numerous other uh, human and civil rights organizations. I have known Fred for some 40 plus years and he's always been a tireless fighter for civil rights, civil liberties, and a thorn in the side of those who would oppose fair treatment for the least of us. He too has presented for us in the past, and I am pleased to welcome him back. <laughs> 
my main man, Fred. He's, he's really saying that because I was head of the Judicial Selection Committee when we recommended him for the appointment to the circuit court, which was one of the best things we ever did because I thought he was a great circuit judge. I want to follow up a little bit on what Bob finished up saying, how the system redistricting has had an adverse effect on those of us who represent poor people, represent black people, and represent the central city. One of the things that the redistricting in Wisconsin did was basically lock in control for the Republican Party in the Wisconsin legislature for a decade. And I'll tell you in a few minutes how that happened, but basically, African Americans, poor people, were excluded from the districts where Republicans were elected and therefore had no ability to influence how the Republicans voted and certainly had not, a, not, enough, not enough ability to make a difference in any of the 60, now 65, Republican assembly seats. They were deliberately excluded. So what was the impact? No person from Milwaukee, no African American, is a committee chairman and can control the agenda. Only one African American sits on the Joint Finance Committee, which has 16 members. So basically, this has had the effect of excluding those from the inner city that's the only person from even Milwaukee who's sitting on that committee. We are excluded from the ability to determine the agenda in the state legislature. I want to talk a little bit about how we got to bringing this lawsuit, which is a Whitford versus Gill lawsuit, which is now before the U.S. Supreme Court. About in, 19, er, in 2013, I convened a meeting of five people. Rick Sachs, uh, Peter Earle, Sachin Chetta, and James Hall, we all got together and we said, we have got to do something about this way the Republicans redistricted because it's excluded a protected group of people who are Democrats who counted for the majority of the votes, particularly for the state assembly in the Obama landslide, and we only had 39 seats that we could win. And they had 60 locked in because they put us and packed us into these huge districts. Now, I've been very concerned over the years about fair districting. And I've made efforts in the past uh, to try to see that we have fair districting. I participated as the Democratic point person in the 71 redistricting, which was probably the only fair map that we ever had. Uh, I tried to intervene in the 71 uh, case, or in the, uh, in the uh, 2001 case and the 2011 to try to do this, uh, but I was rebuffed. I couldn't get standing, so we couldn't uh, appeal the decisions. So the five of us met in Watts Tea Room. Well, many of you know where Watts Tea Room is downtown. We met for breakfast because we knew that no Republicans would ever go there for breakfast. And we could talk and talk freely, and we, uh, we sat there for probably every two weeks, and then we finally added uh, Bill Whitford. Now, Bill Whitford's been an old friend of mine. He, uh, he helped me in my, in my first campaign when he was chairman of the UW Young Democrats. And he went to uh, become a law professor, and a very distinguished law professor. He represents uh, uh, probably uh, one of the uh, most important people who've developed uh, consumer law, the consumer rights uh, philosophy. And when he was recently honored at, uh, at uh, a symposium that Temple University put on, the principal speaker who said, this man has inspired me to do the work that she was doing was Elizabeth Warren. So he's probably responsible for bringing Elizabeth Warren uh, 
out to the forefront as a consumer advocate. And so we're very proud of, uh, of having Bill uh, as part of this. Uh, Bill uh, and, and James Hall played a very crucial decision. Bill suggested that um, we contact a guy named uh, Rick Pildes. And James knew Rick Pildes, and James went out to New York to chat with Bill, uh, Rick Pildes. And uh, Rick Pildes, we sent him a whole series of documents of the, how the Republicans manipulated this redistricting process to exclude anybody and to uh, basically uh, lock themselves into uh, power. And Rick Pildes sent us an article and the article was, was uh, a, he was reviewing an article for a law review uh, that was being going to be published. It was written by two guys, a guy named uh, 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 McGee from UCLA and another person named uh, Nick Stephanopoulos, who, uh, who was a professor and a lawyer at the University of Chicago. And they came up with a method for de determining how to evaluate partisan redistricting. Back about 25 years ago, uh, Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy, one of the conservatives on the court, said, I don't like partisan redistricting, but I cannot figure out how to measure it. And these professors came up with the magic bullet of how to measure it. And so, we, and, uh, we invited, uh, I think, Bill, you called uh, 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 Professor Stephanopoulos and said, we're meeting every day, every two weeks in um, Watts' tea room. He came up and he brought his girlfriend along. And his girlfriend was very important because she worked for a committee called the Chicago Committee for uh, Civil Rights Under Law. She was the voting rights director for that. She's now his wife. And they looked at this and they said, we can get a, a, a national lawyer to help you. So they got a, a woman who had been a clerk for the U.S. Supreme Court for Justice uh, Stevens uh, named Michelle Ordizzi and her law firm, Meyer Brown, a thousand person law firm, to represent us for free. And uh, she also said, I can raise some money for you. And she raised $100,000 so that we could hire the experts that we needed to have to put this case together. And so what we did, we wanted to file it in, uh, in the Western, Eastern District in Wisconsin because we thought Judge Edelman would probably be the best judge we could get, but we were a little bit afraid we were going to get Judge Randa, and he could be the worst judge we could get. So we decided we would file it in the Western District of Wisconsin where we thought, well, there's three judges, uh, and, but they have to appoint a three-judge panel when you do a redistricting case. And these go directly to the U.S. Supreme Court. They don't stop in the Seventh Circuit. These are the type of unique cases that go directly to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the chief judge in the Seventh Circuit appoints the judges to hear the case. So we got uh, Barbara Crabb, who was a, a Carter appointee. Then we got uh, Bill Griesbach, who was a Bush appointee from Green Bay. And then, to our disappointment, we got a retired judge from Indiana who was appointed by Ronald Reagan, Kenneth Ripple. And we thought, oh my God, we've lost the case. We're going to have to appeal this to the Supreme Court before we do this. Turns out that Judge Ripple was probably the best judge you could get. He's well respected by all sorts of the legal community. And he wrote the hundred and some page decision that said the Republican redistricting plan that they adopted is unconstitutional. And we had long hearings, we had motions to dismiss, we had summary judgment motions that we won, and then we had a, a four day trial that we won, and I will tell you, that was just absolutely great. And. Uh, I want to go into a, lot, a couple of other things, but I'm going to defer to my other two panels, and I'll answer questions afterwards. But I can tell you this. I am excited about this. I think this is one of the most significant things I have ever been involved with. And I think all of us who are on that initial committee understand 
that if we win this case before the United States Supreme Court, this is going to be almost as important as Brown versus the Board of Education. Because what this case will do, it presumes and preserves democracy. It says that if we win and we establish a standard, and we don't have a guarantee that we'll establish a standard, but if they establish a standard, nobody is going to ever be able to, again, manipulate redistricting so as to deprive a class of people, which are the class of people is Democratic voters, from ever having an opportunity to win an election. And that's what we're trying to uh, stop. So I'm going to turn this over now. I'm going to turn it over to our, our, our master of ceremonies, uh, the, the, the former judge, uh, and uh, uh, have him introduce the next panel. This is utterly exciting. Black. Yeah. Uh, next. Uh, again, an old friend, attorney James H. Hall, Jr. And he's a lawyer of some 40 years experience. Uh, focusing his practice, it looks good to be that old. Focusing his practice in the areas of protection of civil rights and civil liberties. He's the former president of the Milwaukee branch of the NAACP, a former officer in the Milwaukee ACLU, and has a long and distinguished record of fighting in the various courts for justice for those most in need among us. We have had the pleasure of Attorney Hall's wisdom and experience many times at brainstorming over the years, and he has always enlightened and informed us, and I welcome him back. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Judge Stamper, and thanks to Community Brainstorming for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Good morning to all of you. I'm very happy to be here and to um, be a part of this important discussion. I will um, pick up where um, the other two panelists left off and be a bridge for um, Bill Whitford. Professor Smith um, talked about the um, history of voting uh, as it relates to African Americans in this country. And he talked about um, the obstacles and challenges and barriers that essentially from the time blacks arrived in this country up until the Civil War, um, voting, the, the entitlement to vote was non-existent. After the Civil War, with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, um, there was legislation then, or there, there, there was an entitlement for blacks, at least black males, to vote. However, as he said, from the end of the Civil War up until 1965, there were barriers, poll taxes, literacy tests, vouchers for, vouchers for good character, grandfather clauses, outright violence, all of those things stood in the way of blacks and voting. And I should say not only blacks who were largely in the South, but Latinos in, in, in the West. And um, so in, after a century, really, from 1865 until 1965, after a century of these barriers, and, and by the way, it wasn't just the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment that had been passed. There were a number of other um, laws and acts that Congress passed uh, that, that provided uh, the right to vote, you know, that, that, that um, expanded on the rights um, set forth in the 14th and 15th Amendment. But basically, none of those were effective and none of those were enforced. They were just laws that were on the books. So after a century of this, and with the Civil Rights Movement, 
And you all know, we all know, from uh, Rosa Parks in the late 50s to what was going on in the early 60s, you had the March on Washington in 1963, then you had President Johnson putting forth the Civil Rights Bill of 1964, and in 64, there was the whole bloody summer of 64 in Mississippi with registering people, trying to register people to vote and people getting killed and all of these things, the pressure of Dr. King and others in the civil rights movement. So a week before Bloody Sunday, on March 15, 1965, President Johnson delivered a national address in which he declared that all Americans must have the privilege of citizenship regardless of race. And he announced that he was proposing a voting rights bill. He was sending it to Congress and urging the Congress to pass it. And um, essentially, the bill did go to Congress, and Congress did pass it, what became the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I would urge you, uh, some remember it, but for those who weren't around, or if you haven't seen it, you can go on YouTube and look at the speech of Pres President Johnson to the nation and his uh, commencement address at Howard University as well. In those speeches where he, I, I think no president has um, articulated you know, as directly and clearly um, the, the, the values of equality and, and, and race and so forth in this country. It's important to uh, look at. And I might add, um, Rob mentioned the, um, the solid South, Democratic South. After President Johnson pushed that legislation through, the whole South, which had been Democratic, that's when the flip occurred and all of the South became Republican. Uh, because you know of that and other civil rights legislation, but I digress on that. Back to the so the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed. Now it bans racial discrimination in voting practices by the federal government as well as state and local government. It 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 it, it and as I said, all the things like poll taxes, literacy tests, all of those. It bans all of those types of practices. It has been said, including the Depart U.S. Department of Justice calls the Voting Rights Act the most effective civil rights act ever enacted in this nation. It's widely regarded as enabling uh, the enfranchisement of millions of minority voters, diversifying the electorate and, um, and legislative bodies at all levels of American government. It's the Voting Rights Act that allowed that to happen. Now, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, it was enacted, but it's not just uh, there on the books for it. It has to be reauthorized. Uh, so it's been reauthorized by Congress four times since uh, it was enacted. The most recent time in 2006, when both the House and Senate approved it, in a bipartisan manner. And that was after conducting 20 hearings, hearing from 90 expert witnesses, conduct, con, con, collecting 15,000 pages of te testimony, and so forth. Under the current reauthorization, it's set to expire in 2032. So it will need to be reauthorized by 2032. Now, the Voting Rights Act contains numerous provisions that regulate elections, but a couple, you've heard of some of these. A, a very important provision is Section 2. Section 2 is a general provision that prohibits every state and local government from imposing vo any voting law that results in discrimination against racial or language minorities. Um, and as I said before, there are other provisions that generally outlaw literacy tests and similar devices that were historically used to disenfranchise racial minorities. The act contains certain special provisions that apply to only certain jurisdictions. One of the special provisions that you've heard a lot about is Section 5. Section 5 is a pre-clearance provision. What that, what that 
does is it prohibits certain jurisdictions in the nation that have a history of outright discrimination. It prohibits them, these specific jurisdictions, from making any changes affecting voting without getting pre-approval from the federal government, either the U.S. Attorney, uh, U.S. Attorney General, I should say, or the U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C. So to keep them from you know, reverting, they, they have a history, so they have to get pre-clearance before they would make any change. Now, that's Section 5. It lists the uh, jurisdictions. It, it provides the language that requires this pre-clearance. Section 4, I should say, Section 4B is the section that provides the coverage formula for Section 5. In other words, it's Section 4B that has, provides the formula of what jurisdictions should be included for Section 5. And um, there's a case in June of 2013. I'm, I just want to tell about two cases and then I'm essentially going to be done. There was an important case, Supreme Court case, Shelby versus Holder, you know, Eric Holder, the Attorney General. Shelby versus Holder that I, that impacted Section 4 and Section 5. But let me just say, before this case, the jurisdictions that were covered by Section 4B were nine states, uh, Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, Texas, and Virginia, and then parts of six other states, parts of California, Florida, Michigan, New York, North Carolina, and South Dakota. These were all areas where a history of voting discrimination had occurred and, and they had to have pre-clearance before they could make any changes. Anyway, in a case, Shelby versus Holder in June of 2013, the US Supreme Court struck down the coverage formula you know, that contained those jurisdictions, basically finding that it was outdated, um, it, 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 it had outlived you know, its purpose. It was um, that, that basically a new coverage form formula was needed you know, to keep up with the current time and so forth, that, it, that that formula had outlived its usefulness and there needed to be a new formula to say which jurisdictions should be applied now. So with the coverage formula struck down, while the court didn't strike down Section 5 itself, the pre-clearance requirement, it knocked out the coverage formula. So unless Congress comes up with a new coverage formula, essentially Section 5 is, is, um, is inoperative. So that's the way we are now in terms of not having the benefit of the Section 5 pre-clearance formula. Now, um, but it is important to note that Section 5 was not struck down, it's still there. Now on Monday, I want to mention one other case. On Monday of this week, May 22nd, in another case before the Supreme Court, a case named Cooper versus Harris, the US Supreme Court struck down two congressional districts in North Carolina, uh, districts one and 12, ruling that the North Carolina legislature violated the Constitution by relying too heavily on race in drafting those districts. Um, that decision is viewed as likely to affect many voting rights, especially in the South. It's the latest of a series of setbacks for Republican-led legislatures. Um, in recent cases concerning legislative maps in Alabama and Virginia as well, the Supreme Court has held that packing black voters into a few districts uh, which dilutes their votes, violates the Constitution. Now, that case, and I'm segueing to Bill now, that case, Cooper versus Harris, is important, um, or I should say it, it's, of, it's of some concern for our position because, um, for one thing, um, remember, in this case, Monday, the Supreme Court decided race um, the legislature had a lot relied too heavily on race and it, it and that it was um, um, 
um, unconstitutional. Now, uh, the case is concern of concern to us because uh, Fred talked about the case that we brought, and he talked about the uh, case that we, the old Supreme Court case that we are are um, bringing our case, you know, pursuant to, and the justice that we have to appeal to in that case is just it, based on that case. It's Justice Kennedy. It was Justice Kennedy who left the door open for partisan gerrymandering, you know, saying if you can show the right formula. Well, in this case on Monday, well, for one thing, the case was handed down by an unusual coalition of justices, Thomas, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Kagan authored the majority decision. In dissenting, Justice Alito, joined by Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kennedy, wrote that the challengers had not shown that race, as opposed to partisanship, motivated the drawing of the maps. And Judge Alito said, race and partisanship, you know, the one's race, for instance, if black voters are almost so totally democratic voters, then race and partisanship are so closely connected that it's hard to, sh to discern which it is, and partisan gerrymandering is lawful, just, Justice Alito said. Now, Justice Kennedy joined in the opinion with Justice Alito, which now some, some scholars believe that um, Justice Kennedy joining that opinion was merely, it was merely a, a kind of a description of the current law, although others wonder whether uh, it is a hint that Justice Kennedy is not quite ready to find um, partisan gerrymandering uh, unconstitutional. I guess we'll find out. That's what our case is about. But anyway, um, that's um, my take, and I'll now um, sit and wait for questions. I will point out that um, there are flyers in the back relating to our whole effort and the whole uh, what we have to do in this case to come up with new maps and that type of thing. There are enough for, you can get them when you, when you go out. But I would encourage people that we want people to be involved with the um, drawing of maps and you know, what we have to do assuming this matter you know, goes forward and the legislature you know, um, has to adopt a new map we, we'd like, it's not just to be something that the lawyers do, but community involvement. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Gerrymandering. I think it's the first time we heard that word this morning. That's what, that's what this is, unfair gerrymandering. Uh, and we need to stop it. The black folks are Democrats kill Democrats and kill black folks, period. All right, and last and certainly not least on our list is Professor William Whitford. And he joined the University of Wisconsin Law School faculty in 1965 and has taught a wide range of business law subjects since then. And lately, he has taught chiefly in the contracts area. His research interests have included contracts, bankruptcy, consumer protection, and taxation. Professor Whitford has also taught several years in East Africa and maintains an active interest in that area of the, of the world. He has been actively engaged with the law school's Legal Education Opportunity Program, LEO, over many years and describes it as one of his passions. I also can point out that uh, one of our members uh, has also been uh, a student, fortunately, uh, of him. That's Mr. Terman Spencer. There he is in the shades, the cool one. All right. <laughs> Professor Whitford's uh, leisure time activities include cooking, biking, and backpacking. I present to us Professor William Whitford. 
Thank you very much, uh, Judge Spencer, and I acknowledge all the other students and old friends that are in the room in addition to Mr. Spencer, uh, Judge Dugan, Judge Hanrahan. Uh, and I want to begin by just letting you know that if you ever have a product you need to market, Fred Kessler is the guy. Uh, he, he has exaggerated my qualifications in history in several details, but it's not my role to take away anything he had to say. Thank you, Fred. Uh, what I want to do in my limited time here is a couple things. I want to try to explain in a little more detail what our legal theory is and what the difference is between racial gerrymandering and the partisan gerrymandering idea that we're trying to get the Supreme Court to adopt. And I want to provide a little more detail about where the case stands, just very particular in detail uh, at this moment. But let me begin with the legal theory. Uh, uh, Mr. Hall uh, explained about the racial gerrymandering cases. There's a lot of precedent for racial gerrymandering cases. There's a lot of racial gerrymandering cases. One of them decided by the Supreme Court, as he mentioned just this week. The idea of racial gerrymandering cases, when here the precedent is very, is well established constitutional theory under the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, is that it's unconstitutional to draw district lines uh, with race as in mind, primarily in drawing the lines, if the effect is to lessen the uh, influence, legislative influence, of uh, some disadvantaged group, usually African Americans, but here in Milwaukee, in a recent case, it involved the Latino uh, voters of South Side of Milwaukee. Uh, but that was the same theory. So what we're trying to do is to take that precedent and by analogy say, well, it should also be uh, unconstitutional to draw the lines so as to lessen the legislative influence, the influence in the legislature of, an, of a group defined by their partisan identity, in our case, Democrats. So that's the leap from race to partisan identity. Now there's one other difference. The precedent makes clear, and Cooper versus Harris is the case that uh, Attorney Hall just talked about, is a good example. The racial gerrymandering cases, the analysis is district by district. It's not a statewide analysis. Is this district where the lines drawn with race in mind and was the effect to lessen the political influence of an identified ethnic group? That was essentially the holding uh, in 2012 with respect to two districts on the south side of Milwaukee designed to lessen the influence of Latino voters by essentially keeping the Latino voters from winning any either of the districts being. Uh, that was the idea. But in the partisan gerrymandering co context, uh, we are not advancing a district-by-district district analysis. We're going on a statewide analysis. That's the leap we're trying to make. And that'll be one of the big arguments in the Supreme Court, whether uh, by going from district-by-district district analysis in the race area to a statewide analysis in the partisan area, we're breaking from precedent enough that the Supreme Court's not willing to buy it. Uh, we already know that the state, the, the, our opponents are going to argue that in the Supreme Court. But our idea is basically this, and Fred Kessler presented it very well. If the Democrats get a majority of votes in the state, they should be able to get a majority in the state assembly or the state senate. It's the relationship to the statewide partisan vote to the partisan divide in the legislature is the key statistic in the presentation that we're making. And it really goes to the heart of democracy because if there's any core, democracy means many things and should, but one extraordinarily key idea is the majority should rule. And what we're arguing is that this apportionment in Wisconsin prevents the majority of voters from electing majority in the legislature of people of their partisan identity. 
And at trial, Fred mentioned the trial, it was about a year ago, four-day trial, our experts, we had wonderful experts hired with this money that Fred mentioned, really highly qualified experts, uh, established that Wisconsin, the Wisconsin apportionment, yeah, the word entrenchment is used by Judge Ripple in his wonderful opinion, has basically entrenched the Republicans into the majority status in the state assembly and the state senate. Elections don't matter. Of course, they matter, especially primaries, as to which representative will hold a particular seat. Elections don't matter as to which party will be the majority party in the assembly and the senate, and the, and the experts can pretty much show that. And it won't change under this apportionment throughout the decade. So majority rule is at stake. Well, as Fred mentioned, uh, we won in the trial court uh, two to one. There was a dissent by Judge Griesbach. Uh, when that decision came down just after the election, November 20th, uh, the court then asked for additional briefing on remedy. What should be the consequence of holding that the current apportionment uh, is unconstitutional? And they, there was some briefing and uh, by the lawyers, and then uh, the opinion came down in January, January 20th, if I remember the date right, uh, which uh, did two things. First, it held, when it comes to the question of who should draft the next districting scheme, who's got the, the power to do the next districting scheme, the legislature retains that, or the legislature and the governor to propose a new map, one that's less partisan. That map will have to be vetted or approved by the court. There'll be a chance to challenge it as still too partisan. But the legislature has the exclusive right to propose the next map, and then the question will just be, do they go do a good enough job? Others don't have a chance to propose to the court a map that the court could just adopt, at least not yet, until the legislature flunks. Again, a second time. <laughs> But the second thing they decided, and this was very important, of course, we would prefer the legislature didn't have that power, but they do. And the, the precedent is pretty strong in that direction. Uh, the second thing they did, and this was a real win for us, the state had asked that the question of drawing new districts be held in abeyance until the Supreme Court had a chance to review the trial court's decision, what's called a stay. That meant that we would not get a remedy for 20, the 2018 elections for all practical purposes because we knew the Supreme Court process, the earliest we can really expect a Supreme Court decision is, uh, I'll say, March 2018, sometime between March and June 2018. And there just simply wouldn't be time to draft a new redistricting scheme after that and put it in place for the 2018 elections. Uh, candidates began gathering uh, no, signatures for nomination papers, uh, raising money, deciding whether they're going to run at all by spring 2018 at the latest. So, uh, so the court ordered the legislature, uh, if they're going to use their right to produce the next produce the next edition of the districting scheme, to submit to the court for approval what I'll call a contingent redistricting plan. It's contingent because it would only be going into effect if the Supreme Court affirms, the Supreme Court affirms the trial court decision. They ordered the legislature to submit that by, number, by November 1st, uh, 2017. So the legislature is under that order. And if they don't comply, uh, then they sacrifice their exclusive right to, to propose the next map. Uh, now, what the state has done, they've appealed to the Supreme Court, as we've talked about. Uh, they've also asked the Supreme Court for that stay that the trial court denied. Uh, in other words, they've asked the Supreme Court to reverse the trial court on this November 1st deadline. Consequence of that, if the Supreme Court were to grant it, would be even if we win in the Supreme Court, the remedy wouldn't be until the 2020 election. So we're expecting a decision for Supreme Court on that issue by the end of June. The Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, goes into uh, um, recess, summer recess, the end of June, and generally doesn't issue orders after that. So we're expecting to know uh, by the end of June, and and we're fairly confident they'll deny the stay and keep the November 1st date 
uh, in place, but that's certainly something to look forward to, uh, to look for in terms of the next development in this case. Now, I won't go into too much uh, legal detail, but uh, we're also uh, expecting the Supreme Court to make another decision by the end of June called noting probable jurisdiction. I'm not going to bother to define what that means, but the effect of it is to set up a briefing schedule to get the case for the lawyers to file briefs on both sides to get the case ready for argument in the Supreme Court. And if we get that order, everybody's expecting it. The state's expecting it. We're expecting it. The legal experts are expecting it. Uh, this case will be set ready for argument before the Supreme Court on the basic merits, on the question of whether the current apportionment is uh, unconstitutional as a partisan gerrymander, which will involve having to evaluate our effort to take the racial gerrymandering cases and extend them to a partisan gerrymandering theory in the ways I described. We're expecting that argument in October or November. Supreme Court takes a while to decide cases, so that's why I say March 20, after argument, so I'll say March 2018 is perhaps the earliest we can expect an opinion. Uh, the only other point I want to make, and then we'll sort of discussion, uh, the, the, pam the pamphlet was suggested from going all the way back to the Watts Tea Room uh, one of the things that the group that ultimately stumbled onto the, these wonderful lawyers we have uh, and got the case filed, but the group including Fred and myself and James, we set up a civic engagement uh, side, uh, we call, it's called Fair Elections Project, and that, they're the ones who produced the pamphlet. They're co-chaired by a couple of former uh, state legislators, one a Republican, one a Democrat. And they're kind of lobbying for redistricting reform. And the basic idea here is we need to change the whole system in the United States by how legislative districts are drawn. Uh, we say in many countries, uh, voters choose their legislators. In the United States, legislators choose their voters <laughs> through the districting process. We need to change that. And we also need to make sure, as long as legislatures have the right to draw the legislative districts, uh, we need to make sure they at least do it in an open and transparent manner. The, the 2011 apportionment we're challenging was done behind closed doors. Not even Republican legislators knew the whole scheme. They only knew what their new district would look like, not what their neighbor's new district would look like. Until the very last minute, there was no public input, no, there was one d hearing that was strictly pro forma with very little notice. It wasn't democracy. It was a bunch of legislative leaders deciding how to draw the districts in their own best self-interest and have nothing to do about the public interest. Well, now the legislature is under this order to come up with another plan by November 1st. We need citizen action to say, you don't do it that same way. You don't do it behind closed doors. You do it by an open process. You have hearings around the state. You let people know what's happening. So that's what the Fair Elections Project is about. And the pamphlet is back there. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And uh, now we are ready to have questions and answers. Come ahead, sir. Given the demographic trends in this country, where even some states now, I believe, are white minority populace, and the whole country is heading in that direction, wouldn't it be wise for Republicans to actually be in favor of getting rid of partisan gerrymandering because they could be gerrymandered out for the rest of the country's um, existence in that regard? Uh, or do they not think that far ahead or are they just worried about power at the current times? Who's your question directed to, please? Anyone? Okay. He, the panel has wisdom. All right. Panel. I'll respond uh, initially. Uh, I, uh, I think that the Republicans probably are not going to be doing that because what the pattern of the Republicans has been uh, 
has been to try to restrict voting rights. So they've asked for a voter ID uh, to discourage people. They've tried to limit uh, early voting, which uh, we know uh, is a favored by African Americans. They've tried to place other barriers uh, in terms of you know, citizenship and uh, other obstacles in the way of people. And so I think by virtue of that, they are trying to reduce the size of the electorate and in order to keep control. I don't think that's going to work, and I think eventually they're going to have to change their position on this because you cannot run a political party without having a broad coalition. And the broad coalition requires you to have immigrants and uh, minority members and uh, uh, people from rural and urban areas. And so I think what they're trying to do is actually not going to work. I think Fred's quite right about Wisconsin, but it's fair to say that uh, partisan gerrymandering, uh, Democrats do it too in other states uh, and have done it. Uh, and in some of those states, Republicans are actually supporting our case. Uh, yeah, the important thing to remember is that districting, line drawing, is done by state by state. It's not done federally. Uh, so you can have different positions in the parties depending on what state you're in. But uh, amongst the Republicans who are supporting our state, the most famous is Arnold Schwarzenegger, the former Republican governor of California. Uh, the Republicans in Illinois uh, think that there's a Democratic gerrymander there. And uh, there's a number of cases that are kind of lining up to be filed if we were to win in our theory. Partisan gerrymandering cases around the country, and some of them uh, will be against alleged Democratic gerrymanders. So uh, in some states, the Republicans are feeling victimized and doing what you suggest. Hello, my name is Vian. Hold on a second. Hello, my name is Viana Jordan. Um, mine is more of a statement and a solution. What I see is the Democratic Party only comes around right before an election and then comes to um, get the vote. How come? They're not out here securing this vote now, nurturing this vote, keeping up with this vote, if they need it like they say they do. And I would like to say my solution is, if this doesn't work, is that we use our good friends up north and in other districts to start, well, I feel like Congresswoman Moore's district is secure so start taking people out of this district and sending them up there 28 days prior and then sending them to the um, polls from there. That's just me. <laughs> I'm, I'm going I'm to respond uh, to say this, that uh, those of us who are involved with uh, this case are going to offer uh, probably uh, in the legislature at least an alternative map. And the alternative map is going to be a fair map that treats each party's uh, so that any party, either the Republicans or the Democrats, would have a chance of winning depending on how the voters go. So that's one of the things that we want to try to do is to make sure that there is a fair map. And that fair map is going to sort of uh, probably have a pretty big impact in Milwaukee where the Republicans sort of, they merged Wauwatosa and Brookfield together. Now you know Wauwatosa is tending to go slightly Republican, but it's trending Democratic. Brookfield, of course, votes 70% Republican. So what do we have now in the legislature? Two representatives from Brookfield. Two representatives from New Berlin. Uh, you know, I mean, they've ended up drawing these districts so that these suburbs are disproportionately represented. I would anticipate that if we are successful, 
we're going to have three to four new seats in the Milwaukee area where Democrats have a reasonable chance of winning, and probably at least one of them will have a sizable African-American uh, community. So that's what I'm hoping, and that's what we're hope, uh, the, uh, the way we can go. And I think we'll see a lot of changes around the rest of the state. My name is Sarah Patch, and I'm, I'm a basic scientist. Louder, please. Uh, my name is Sarah Patch, and I'm a scientist at UWM. And so I have a question about the formula that I think was developed by Professor Stephanopoulos down in Chicago. Um, that's been applied, and you've certainly looked at it for Wisconsin. Has that been applied across the country, and how does it look? Are other parts of the country equally uh, as gerrymandered as we are? Uh, well, yes and no. It has been applied uh, all across the country by our experts. Uh, one in particular, and the evidence is in the trial court, uh, he's applied the formula to all legislative elections since sometime in the 70s. Uh, and it can be applied. And what you find is a range of degrees of partisanship. The formula is called the efficiency gap. Uh, it's a way of measuring how partisan uh, a gerrymander is. Uh, or how unpartisan it is if it has a low efficiency gap. The higher the efficiency gap, the more partisan. You know, some, I don't remember what the total number was, but uh, the total number of legislative elections he applied it to from sometime in the 70s to date, Wisconsin is in the top or bottom 1%. I don't know whether it is, what do you call our, poor, our it's the most extreme. I mean, we're the worst or the best. I mean, you, you can, <laughs> You can look at it this way. What were they trying to do, those legislative aides who drafted this? Of course they were trying to entrench themselves into a majority. They did a very good job. That's what I mean by best. But anyhow, we're the most partisan. So, I mean, uh, not the most, but just about the most over a 50 year period. I might also just make one further comment on this. It's mainly an issue uh, for states where one party is in complete political control. If there's divided control, because, for example, Democrats controlled the state Senate, or the Demo there was a Democratic governor, then you don't find this extreme partisanship because there's some political bargaining and so forth, that, or else the parties can't get together and then the court imposes a plan. It's single party control, and that was true in Wisconsin. That's what happened in the 2010 election. That's why we got this best of the best or worst of the worst, depending on your point of view. My name is Chrysandra Lilly, and I'm the proud mother of Antoinette Lilly, my daughter. She's deceased. This is to the panel, anybody. What kind of legislation or anything is there for a person, a mom, in a situation that I'm in? Um, my daughter was supposed to have had a heart transplant, a liver transplant, a lung transplant, all that I didn't know anything about. But it turns out she did not have the heart transplant. All the money has been recovered here in Wisconsin. I could not get nobody to do an autopsy for a whole month. When we did, we had to take her over to Illinois. And everything I'm saying is um, public information. Uh, the, the doctor that did the autopsy, their place was raided and uh, body parts was found there, heads, all these and these kind of things. Organs was there recovered. People that were supposed to have been cremated was there. Uh, I've been trying to get an attorney, get help. I've been just about everywhere to the state, and they're just turning me away, saying, okay, we know, but nothing. What, what do I do? And I'm here, I'm pleading for help from anybody that I can. I end up, after going through so many attorneys, uh, I filed a lawsuit myself, because if her story is ever told, and it is very significant, I, want to, I wanted to show that I fought for her. And so I would just like to know what kind of legislation, where do you go when you have to fight for yourself? Well, I don't think this panel is called upon to address that question, ma'am. We're talking here about fairness and redistricting and uh, seeking relief in the courts for what has happened in Wisconsin. And uh, you're, not that we don't have sympathy for your concern, uh, 
but that's really not what we're here to deal with. So thank you. Um, you may want to talk to these. Yeah, I agree. Obviously, this, you know, what you say um, evokes sympathy. But this panel is about voting and redistricting. But what I would say is, you say you've talked to a lot of lawyers. There are law. Well, I'm a lawyer. But there are lawyers who specialize in the types of cases you mentioned, meaning if medical malpractice cases, if someone, a doctor, a hospital, a medical facility did something wrong, there are lawyers who specialize in that. And generally, those lawyers are real willing to review your matter, and if it's a meritorious claim, they are willing to take it on because it's, you know, that's what they do. So I would say, you know, keep talking to lawyers who specialize in that area, and if the case has merit in terms of showing that someone did something wrong, I would think there would be lawyers willing to take it on. I can suggest the names of some lawyers to you, okay, who specialize in that area. Thank you. Sir. Well, thank you. My name is Clyde Winter. Um, and uh, uh, I have a, a, regarding this issue, I have one, there was a, um, a point that was made by one of the panelists that the majority of an important principle of democracy, a majority should rule. Um, but um, actually that's not quite an accurate representation of a major principle of democracy. An important principle of democracy, at least in the United States, is that the majority, if, if the majority rules, the minority still has rights. That's an important thing. More and more appropriate um, description of the principle of democracy is that the min um, everyone, including the minority, should get proportional representation. Everyone, including the minority, should get proportional representation for their numbers. And we cannot get this with districting, the districting system. Districts are not required by the Constitution. In fact, the Constitution um, uh, uh, provides that districts are, con are unconstitutional. We do have a means now of getting r proportional representation. And it's a different way of, um, of conducting the election or of actually counting votes. It's uh, called, um, uh, it's called uh, instant runoff voting or proportional representation. Um, Rank preference voting, I'm sorry, the term is rank preference voting. That would give us, um, this particular case that we have before us is actually not about protecting the constitutional rights of the people. It's about, it's about a turf war between the two permitted parties. Districting itself manages to maintain that lock, that chokehold lock of the two major parties on government in the United States. Um, change the whole system. I think that was recommended also. Change the whole system is a good idea. And we should start in this case and realize that we're not changing the whole system with this. We are just basically, this, is, this, this was a situation in which the Republican Party, the managers of the Republican Party, in an outrageous fashion, violated our rights, the rights of the people, in doing this districting. And they did it just totally for their advantage. No question of that. But this case is about basically that the managers of the Democratic Party said, ouch, said, ow, oh, this hurts. We're getting hurt here. And they want a remedy for it. It's only remedying the Democratic Party. It's not remedying um, democracy and constitutional protections of the rights of an individual. Thank you. Anybody want to take a stab at that? No takers? All right, next. All right, wait, 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 wait. I don't want to rush you. Come on. I'll just say one thing. I think the gentleman, I've forgotten your name, uh, Winter, Mr. Winters raises a number of very important issues about uh, how we should uh, structure elections in the United States. I think in, in conducting this case, uh, we had to ask, uh, in, in structuring this case, we had to ask, what could we accomplish through a lawsuit with the U.S. Supreme Court as presently constituted? Uh, I think many of the reforms you suggest, Mr. Winter, uh, 
uh, we can't get the court to order them. Maybe we can pr try to push them in other kinds of directions. But it would be futile to bring a lawsuit asking for that. We'd lose. And I think most of the lawyers agree. So I do think that if we were to succeed, you call it just a turf war. It is a turf war. That's a fair comment. But I think that we'll have a fairer system if we are to succeed than we have right now. It isn't a perfect system. I agree with that. Hi, I'm Glenn Snyder. The voter ID law is a new poll tax. The GOP has changed the laws so that only GOP can vote. What well, with the uh, voter ID poll tax, redistricting, et cetera. Uh, we've got to get rid of the Electoral College. Uh, we've, we've had, uh, we have been already ruled due to this law. The elections are rigged. Uh, they cannot, uh, uh, they, they come out of the twilight zone to overturn the elections. I'm, I'm sick of the self-righteous tin gods from the GOP party and their drug tests for welfare recipients. This is big brothers of dictatorship. Who in the hell are these punky GOP tin gods such as Tim, Scott Walker, Jensen, Robin Voss, the boss, uh, Paul Ryan, etc. The GOP claims they're for family values, but they screwed the families of the Janeville uh, General Motors workers. I, I have friends out there, for example. Uh, uh, it's, it's a it's a wonder they don't over, over they didn't overturn cars and and jap auto dealers and torch them. We must drive the GOP out of political office. They represent big money. Well, the the Democrat Party represents the workers. The the, the GOP Party is vicious, violent, vindictive. They're backed by big money such as the Bradley Foundation, the Koch brothers. I even wrote them letters and shadowy. Uh, pressure groups. The Democrat Party needs a complete makeover. I change everything, such as the name and, and the label. Dump the ass nine donkeys. I, 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 a, a lot of party hacks should be fired. We, we, we need enlightened liberals. Uh, I buttonhole Matt Flynn to run for governor against that self-righteous tin horn Baptist Scott Walker. I've just simply exploded in white hot anger over, 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 over his type of stuff, so help me. God. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I agree with the last speaker, but I want to say I want to say this. Uh, my name is Matt Flynn. I know a lot of you. I was the former chairman of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin. I'm just a Democrat. That's what I am. What I'd like to offer to the panel. This is an excellent legal team we have here. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, the basic key to winning oral argument, and, and this was originally said by Judge Thomas Fairchild, one of the great judges in our state, is make the judge want you to win. And if the judge wants you to win, he or she will find a way for you to win. There's an argument here, I don't know if it's in the briefs or in the oral argument, but I want to throw it out. And that is this. Um, this is an illegitimate legislature, it's unconstitutionally created, but right now it's going to have the ability to pick the seven delegates to a constitutional convention that they're proposing. There are more than 30 Republicans who want it. When they convene, they have no rules. They can do what they want. They want a uh, balanced budget amendment. If they passed it, it would mean that every time they make a trillion dollar tax cut, the Constitution would require that they cut the domestic programs. And more importantly, they could amend the first, fourth, fifth, and 14th amendments. If I were in that argument to the Supreme Court, I'm a lawyer as well, even the worst Republicans on that Supreme Court, the ones that are operating as agents of the Republican Party, can't want a bunch of yahoos with, with donors in the hallway and lobbyists amending the first, fourth, fifth, and 14th amendments because they were picked by all Republicans. There would be no Democrats from Wisconsin on that. It's an argument that I commend to everybody. You may have already made it, but I think it's an important one and it may sway a Republican vote. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate what Matt has to say, but from what I'm understanding, that there are some Republicans, particularly in the state Senate, who are not enthused about uh, passing that constitutional amendment on a balanced budget and, or uh, having a new constitutional convention. I certainly think that all the Democrats will vote against a new constitutional convention, uh, and I'm hopeful 
that there'll be enough Republicans who will join us to stop that. It's a right-wing, ALEC-based, uh, and, and it's actually a John Birch Society-based idea that uh, you, know, you, you thought the John Birch Society was dead. No, it's alive, and uh, it's part of the ALEC uh, group. And they're going to try to to alter the Constitution, and I think that we're going to probably defeat them, but it's not going to be an easy uh, battle. And uh, uh, there's uh, a guy who, who actually showed up here uh, uh, a couple of months ago at, uh, at brainstorming, one of the Republican senators from Delafield. Uh, Senator Kapanga is the big pusher of the, uh, of the Constitutional Convention, uh, and uh, it's a little scary. American Legislative Exchange Council. It's funded by the Koch brothers and Mr. Eline from uh, uh, the Chicago suburbs and a lot of the right-wingers, and they're trying to uh, establish an agenda uh, that includes ending union rights, uh, and they certainly Im imposed it, and the Bradley Foundation funds a lot of that stuff, and they are really sort of anti-democratic. Having lived in North Carolina for 15 years, I want to add a name to that, which is Art Pope. Art Pope is the equivalent of the Koch brothers, and he's the one who single-handedly uh, ruined North Carolina. <laughs> uh, but my question, if Fred's heard it a number of times and nobody br brought it up really, is the word unconstitutional and what's going to happen to the legislation in Wisconsin if the Supreme Court also uses the word unconstitutional. So let me ask my question a little differently. Is there a chance that if, when the Supreme Court rules in our favor, they do not use the word unconstitutional, and then what happens to all the legislation that's been passed since Walker became governor? <laughs> I'm going to answer that. That's, yeah, because you've done it before. That's, that's one of the most interesting questions. Uh, the the three-judge panel said the legislature as presently constituted is unconstitutional. So if you can a law passed by an unconstitutional legislature stand? And that's a very interesting question. And we don't know what would, uh, we, we don't know first will somebody raise that issue because if the Supreme Court says the legislature is unconstitutional, as the three-judge panel said, what will be the impact of that on the laws that they passed, particularly this session, passed after that, that declaration and even before that declaration? Uh, I don't think the court's going to ex post facto that, though. So, you know, uh, I think that would be pretty substantial disruption in terms of that. But I don't know. We don't know until litigation comes as a result of that. Oh, you guys stay in business and support us? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens on this one. <laughs> uh, hi. My name is Art Heitzer. I'm a lawyer in the city. I want to thank the panelists for both the presentation and the work that they've done in the suit. Uh, I have a historical question, and I guess Bob Smith took off. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he may be the one who, his uh, introductory speech, which I thought was really excellent, uh, raised this in my brain. So it, re it relates to the right to vote, uh, racial politics, history of Wisconsin. So some of you on the panel, I'm sure some of the people in the audience, know that when Wisconsin became a state, there were conflicting referenda as to whether African Americans could vote. Uh, one voted down, second one voted up, took a lawsuit by uh, uh, Gillespie to force the, uh, inf the enfranchisement of African Americans. At the same time, my belief is that uh, non-citizen immigrants in Wisconsin were allowed to vote as long as they said they would plan to become a citizen. The Know Nothing Southeast said even if you were a citizen, you couldn't vote for a number of years. We have the opposite here and in some other states where there were a lot of Europeans who would come in. What I don't know is the status of Native Americans, which presumably was a pretty big uh, 
percentage of the population when the Europeans were allowed to vote before they were citizens. So I invite any of you who know the answer to that question or want to comment on the history of racial politics and the right to vote in Wisconsin to add your thoughts. Thank you. Is your specific question, Art, about the status of Native Americans? Yeah. yeah. I'm, um, I have notes here on the, the committee. I won't repeat what you said about when Wisconsin became a state and the committee um, that um, drafted you know, the, the 1846 Statehood Convention. Uh, the article granting suffrage uh, applied to white citizens of the United States foreign residents who intended to become citizens, and certain Indians. Um, so I don't know, you know, I mean, I, I, I um, so certain Native Americans were covered. I don't know beyond that the specifics, but I, but I do know that certain Native Americans were covered. But, um, but as you say, um, and it's important for people here to know, Wisconsin was really, um, it could be said to have been progressive in its, um, at the time of the Civil War, in, with regard to the right of, of blacks to vote. The fact that it was even, you know, it was in the, um, as Art said, it was in the, um, it, it was back and forth in several referenda and put out to the public several times. And although it uh, didn't pass through those referenda, it was, um, you know, rel it got a lot of support. And then in 1865, the Ezekiel Gillespie case um, established the right to vote at a time when in most of the rest of the country, that wasn't the case. So at that time, Wisconsin was, was, was progressive in that area. Hello. Uh, my name is Nathaniel, a uh, long time, though not as long as some of you residents of Milwaukee. Um, I was going to start out my uh, question with a comment about Johnson, who was a Democratic president that you guys referred to, uh, in that he was making it so that people could vote and that their votes mattered. And when looking at redistricting, I try to think of ways just to talk to it without going through the whole legal theory, though I appreciate that you explained that all to us. Because simply what we're fighting, what you guys are arguing for is not only that did you have people have the ability to vote, what Johnson fought for, but you're having people fight for the ability to have their votes actually matter. I mean, that, this is democracy. This is some, uh, some people might refer to it as a turf war, but hey, if you're, and I expect most of the people in this room are probably strongly one way or the other in terms of their political party. But if you swing back and forth, if your vote doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if you swing back and forth. This is more than about uh, one party. And I simply tell people this is an argument about rigged elections. Because when you go to it, rigged elections are decided long before the people ever show up at the, battle, at the voting uh, booth. Because the point is that their votes don't matter. The people who are already in power pick who's going to stay in power. So this, that's what this is about. This is about making sure your vote matters and that the elections aren't rigged. May I, may I say one point on that? I don't know if we've mentioned today, maybe we have the word polarization. But what this does, um, this partisan gerrymandering, you know, we hear, we know how in the country now things are so polarized. Well, um, this undermines democracy uh, in a way that it contributes to that polarization because when, it, when districts are gerrymandered in a way so that the vote doesn't matter, meaning there's no, there's no appeal to the middle of the road voter or no, you know, the, the voters of the other party in a particular district, their vote don't, doesn't count anyway because it's assured which party will win then the primary becomes the election. The, the, the people who run can be can the most polarized people who just appeal to the extremes of that party. 
So it really, um, um, the gerrymandering contributes to extreme candidates of, of each party, you know, being elected. So it, you know, that's a further um, erosion of our democracy and, you know, a byproduct of the gerrymandering. I'm going to respond also on this because that is really a very important point that uh, what we need to have is a series of districts that are competitive. And what's happened is in this current redistricting, there's probably five or six districts that are really competitive and that's the extent of it. And that's not, that doesn't give people the opportunity to change government. And so any other me, uh, redistricting that comes out, I think has to have a sizable and that's, you, you, you just by virtue of just the geography, you can't have every district uh, actually competitive. But you have to have somewhere between 10 and 20 districts that, that could conceivably change parties depending on uh, how the electorate votes. And that way, at least, you can end up having people who are going to respond to compromise. And that's one of the things that doesn't happen at the present time. It's compromise between the parties does not happen. And so only if you have competitive districts where you have to pe have people reach out to a broader group of uh, voters are you going to really have uh, what I think is effective democracy. Uh, I have a follow-up question now. So. If Wisconsin has turned out to be the worst of the worst, and Shelby versus Holder has struck down the coverage formula, the old coverage formula, then could you argue, could we argue that Wisconsin would be named in a new coverage formula and need special attention and special coverage under the Voting Rights Act? You know, the, um, after um, Shelby versus Holder, 2013, um, a new, an, an amendment, a, a bill was put forth in Congress to um, come up with a new coverage formula, but it didn't pass. And it was a weaker, you know, it was a weak bill. It had less... Um, States less juris fewer jurisdictions than you know than the current than than what was there before, but in 20 um, subsequently I think in 2015, and, and that bill that I mentioned was a bipartisan bill. In fact, Representative Sensenbrenner supported it and all that, but it didn't it didn't pass. The Democrats now uh, introduced a new bill, a stronger bill. Uh, that would, that would um, actually add more um, states. And it has this new formula in the, what's called the Voting Rights Advancement Act, um, um, would, would initially cover 13 states. And it has, um, and Wisconsin isn't one of them. I mean, I could read the 13 states, but Wisconsin isn't one that's in the bill, but I don't, it, that bill isn't, um, you know, isn't rising to the top of the pile either. I don't know where it is, but that's a, it's a more, um, you know, a more um, restorative bill than the earlier bill. The Democrats basically said, if we're not winning anyway, you know, this bipartisan bill that was there before, let's put forth a strong bill and try to, you know, go for what we really need. Senator Leahy um, is the leader in the Senate, and Representative John Lewis uh, was a lead sponsor in the House. So that has 15 states um, and parts of other areas, but um, not Wisconsin. I have a list of what those areas are, but I won't, yeah. So, I, so really, I know the ACLU, and uh, Chris Ott was here earlier, the new ACLU uh, executive director, but the national ACLU is working on this and, you know, uh, with congressional aides and so forth, trying to, 
there's still an effort to try to get a new coverage formula. This will be the last of the line here. All right, come please. Good morning, community brainstorming. Um, I would like to, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, one, <laughs> I'm one of the um, members of Community Brainstorming for a number of years, and I'm uh, just an absolutely very proud member. And I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Eve Hall, who is the new president of uh, Martha Love. I'm Martha Love, Martha Love, Martha Love. <laughs> and um, I would like to welcome Dr. Eve Hall, who's the new president of the Urban League of um, Milwaukee, Dr. Eve Hall. The other critical point I would like to raise is about this constitutional amendment. Currently in the United States of America, we have 34 states that have agreed to convene a constitutional convention to change the Constitution of the United States of America, which has not been changed since the 1700s. They have 33 states that have agreed to convene this constitutional convention. This is one of the most critical issues that's facing us that the National Democratic Committee is working on along with the, a, a number of other great allies. Realizing, and Fred Kessler and the other um, professor hopefully will tell us, what is the real impact? In my opinion, a lot of rights are being taken away from women and other minorities in the United States. At that constitutional convention, they don't just have to stick with one or two issues. They can add anything they want. And from the state of Wisconsin, with the seven delegates, uh, five would be Republicans and two would be Democrats. We would not have a chance of survival for no rights, no democracy in the state of Wisconsin. So I'm going to ask Fred Kessler if he could just elaborate a little bit more. We here at Community Brainstorming need to have a program on the Constitutional Convention which will really open a number of eyes. We will have MATA Community Media here to televise it because this is one of the most critical issues facing us now in the United States, especially for African Americans. They will try to take away women's rights to an abortion. They will try to ins uh, insert uh, a church-state situation where there's a requirement of uh, Christianity or some other religion to be a requirement. They will take away the First Amendment freedoms that we have. They will clearly take away the Fourth and Fifth Amendment freedoms that we have and probably the Sixth Amendment freedoms. This is a really right-wing group that is trying to do it, and uh, I agree with you. You ought to have a program on this. Uh, that would, and I would, I would say, invite Senator Kapanga and let him justify what he would want to do. He came here once, you know, uh, and uh, we ought to, we ought to see how these guys can make a, a, a case for that because I don't think they can, uh, and I think it's really important that people be aware of what, uh, of what they are seeking. They're saying they want us to uh, just put a balanced budget amendment. But uh, uh, Martha is absolutely correct. They can do whatever they want if they get a constitutional convention. And with the Republicans having won control of so many of the legislatures and redistricting the way they did in 211, they're going to try to do that there's a couple of states where the, some of the Republicans have balked at it, and we know that in Wisconsin, some of the senators have balked at it. I think in the assembly, it would be pretty hard to stop it uh, because the, it's pretty well dominated by right-wing Republicans, and these Republicans are afraid of primary elections. And uh, that's, I think, one of the really important reasons that if we can stop it this time, 
uh, that uh, if we win on the uh, on this uh, 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 Whitford versus Gill case, we can probably make sure that this uh, uh, a, a movement at least would stop in Wisconsin, and probably will stop in some of the other case uh, states. Uh, good morning. I'm Mike Hanrahan. I just had a question. This is uh, for Mr. Hall and uh, Professor Whitford. Um, I tried to power read the 149-page decision last night, kind of late. Um, but uh, the the way that I read it, and I clearly, you know, this the redistricting was done for purely partisan reasons. They almost admit that their purpose was to gerrymander. I mean, they said we were. I think they used the Republican Party said we were assertive uh, in the redistricting and aggressive in our redistricting. They use those words, so they they can see that that was their purpose. Um, but if you read in the dissent, uh, Judge Griesbach says this efficiency gap. So what that means, if the Republicans get 51 percent of the vote, this is in real simpl simplistic terms, they get 51 percent of the vote. If they got 58 percent of the seats in the assembly, then that's uh, a nine percent or a seven percent efficiency gap. They get 51 percent of the votes, but 58 percent of the seats. That's the efficiency gap as I understand it. And was it, but the efficiency gap under the pre-2010 um, districting, which was done by judges that had been done by the courts, it had a 7.6 efficiency gap. The Republican redistricting that has is now in effect has an 11.3 percent efficiency gap and so if the republicans get 51 percent of the vote they end up getting 62.3 percent of the assembly seats okay so that's the that's this gross partisan redistricting but my question is how much is unconstitutional because if the 7.6 percent that was done by courts prior to 2010 I don't know if that was. And then even under Democrat redistricting that had been done, uh, it was at 4.3 that the Republicans still had a, uh, an efficiency gap um, advantage under Democrat redistricting. Where, where is the line that a court can draw? And what's the argument that the plaintiffs are going to make that says enough is enough, this is too far? Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, now. You're going to have to power read that opinion again uh, because you haven't quite got the formula down for the efficiency gap. It, it, it's actually, for the lawyers in the room, these are excellent opinions. So the dissent as well as the majority, and it's worth reading. And it's worth reading, not in a power read, but reading. Um, but I don't want to quibble about how we talk the efficiency gap. Uh, my responses are as follow, a couple points to make. Uh, we did propose a, a, a line, so to speak, uh, but the court didn't adopt it. What Rip, Judge Ripple said, and the efficiency gap is not the, that was the kind of our theory, but the political scientists have other, the, other measures they could use, uh, and there was evidence in the case about them as well. What Judge Ripple said is, you know, ultimately, if the court is going to enter the area of trying to police or regulate partisan gerrymandering, they're going to have to decide where the line is, so to speak. Because uh, any map will have, uh, it won't be a zero efficiency gap, or it'll be an occasional uh, map that has zero efficiency gap. Uh, but in this case, it's not necessary to draw that line, because you can take the efficiency gap, you can take what's called partisan bias, you can talk, take what's called mean, median difference, you can take uh, any of the kinds of measures of degree of partisanship out there. And Wisconsin, because it's the worst of the worst, <laughs> Wisconsin is so far over any reasonable line, we don't have to say where the line is. We can say this one's unconstitutional. And we leave for later determination what the precise limit is. So that's what the court said. And I expect our lawyers uh, to support that position. In other words, what we're bringing to this effort at legal reform is a, f a wonderful fact situation. I mean, it's kind of a dismal fact situation, but it's a wonderful fact situation for the Supreme Court to make that jump from racial gerrymandering to partisan gerrymandering uh, because we have such extreme facts. 
Now, the other uh, point, and you mentioned uh, the what Judge Griesbach had to say about the previous apportionment, which was a judge-drawn one, the test we proposed and which uh, Judge Ripple adopted requires uh, two findings by the court. One, that the legislature intended to discriminate, in this case against Democrats, and they really succeeded. They does discriminate. The efficiency gap goes to that second question, what's called the effects test. Uh, but there's also the intent. And the presumption is that when judges draw the plan, they didn't intend to discriminate. So essentially, if judges draw the plan, it gets a free ride under the test we proposed, under the test that Judge Ripple said. Now you mentioned that we had smoking gun evidence in our case, which Judge Ripple talks about on the intent issue uh, this is just anecdote, but it's kind of fun. Uh, because of some sh shenanigans that went on in an earlier case, the one that involved the racial gerrymandering of the two Southside uh, Milwaukee cases, uh, districts the, uh, against Latino residents there, the ra it was a racial gerrymandering issue. Uh, our lawyers, Peter Earle and Doug Poland, had in their possession the hard drives of the computers that the three legislative aides who drafted these plans, this plan, in secret, as I mentioned, we had the hard drives. And they had tried to delete a lot of stuff, but we got a uh, forensic expert, and they hadn't, you know, unlike Hillary, was able to very successfully delete her emails. They hadn't succeeded in deleting all their memos and all that kind of stuff. And we recovered them, and that's where that stuff comes from. And it was smoking gun evidence, and it was extremely embarrassing. I'm telling a very partisan story, because some of these legislative aides had actually testified in court. We did not consider politics. We just considered what was fair. We wanted fair districts. And then we get their memos, and they talk about, well, we're going to junk this one because this one's more partisan. And then we have this partisan. And in the court, there was this chart showing the different plans that they drafted. And they just got increasingly partisan as measured by the efficiency gap until they got about as far as they could possibly go. And then they settled in on that one. So that's just a little anecdote, but it was a kind of dramatic moment in the trial. I'm just going to respond, uh, add a little bit to that. Uh, Peter Earle called me at one point and said, uh, Fred, uh, you know, you were drafting a nonpartisan alternative uh, that was a fair plan. He said, uh, on their hard drive, they had your map. They hacked my they hacked my computer to do that. I mean, these guys were absolutely terrible. Uh, they uh, they uh, uh, we, we knew right away that this was a terrible uh, plan and that it was going to guarantee the Republicans. Uh, 60 seats in the in the state legislature. If you had ever done any redistricting, you knew that there was no chance. There were there were no swing districts. All the Democrats were dumped into heavily Democratic districts, and the Republicans were dumped into districts that leaned Republican, but wasn't, weren't going to swing. And uh, when we got that hard drive, and it was very interesting how we got that hard drive during the recall elections. For one period of time, the Democrats had control of the state Senate. And Michael Best and Friedrich, the law firm that was representing the Republicans, were compelled to turn over the materials to Senator Miller, the Democratic majority leader during that time. He said, we'd like to see your files. When we have control, you're our client. And they were compelled to turn those files over. But the problem that they had, there were two months missing. And so they went to court and said, how come they haven't turned over those two months? And the three-judge panel that decided that earlier Baldus case ordered them to turn over the full files. And that's where we discovered a ton of the evidence that they didn't want us to see. Now, I have to say, Judge Ripple did not talk about the misconduct that they engaged in. But I will tell you, they all knew that that misconduct was going. 
And I think that certainly helped why Ripple wrote this incredible decision. Even though he was a Reagan appointee, I think that he probably looked at this and said, this was so outrageous that uh, we can't let this stand. And that's uh, why I think we won uh, on the three-judge court. Very, very briefly. Very briefly. But an uh, another just anecdotal piece on how the Wisconsin situation is, the Wisconsin fact situation is so blatant, so over the line. When I, um, we talked about the Beath case, this earlier case, Supreme Court case, and Justice Kennedy had said if he could see, if, if someone could articulate a standard, then maybe he would be open to, um, you know, addressing or considering partisan uh, gerrymandering. Well, gerrymandering occurs all over the country. Democrats and Republicans both do it, as we've said, not just here. But the situation here was such that when I went, they mentioned I went to New York to meet with Professor Rick Pildes at NYU. Well, he um, had originally, we were scheduled to meet maybe 20 minutes or so. And, um, you know, we sent him information and all that. And when I went in and talked with him, and he really, um, you know, engaged with the facts situation in Wisconsin, and the blatant facts of, of what had occurred with the legislature and how it was done and the numbers and, you know, he, that's when he, well, we ended up meeting for more than an hour. I mean, because he, a light bulb went and he, that's when he thought of this, you know, this law review article that he knew about with the efficiency gap, that this case may be the case that, you know, can put this forward and you know really impact the rest of the country because the fact situation here was viewed as the most um, egregious or the, the most ideal if you will to try to bring this matter so that's that's what we are dealing with here in wisconsin and the potential impact for the rest of the nation Short call. my name is edward chapman and I just had a simple question. I know uh, I said, uh, I got, my question is kind of simple because you've been talking about the, the gerrymandering and, and uh, solutions and all that stuff. But the, the fact is that it still goes on. And usually when it happens, it takes so long to straighten out that the term is over and the damage is done. So I'm wondering if you can write this in a way so that there's teeth in the bill, so that uh, reparations are immediately available and, and we can move on and, and we can get to go what we want without so much time and so much loss. I'll try to answer that. Okay. When we... Oh, oh, he needs that. Yeah. When, when, uh, when we had the case first up, uh, uh, we, we were prepared in case the court ruled before the 16 election, we were prepared to submit an interim map uh, that could have covered the 16 election. Uh, but they, they didn't rule in, in enough time. We would have wished that they had because we already knew that there had been two elections that were under the unconstitutional map but they waited until the third, and so, you know, uh, but we were prepared to try to do that uh, in case we could do that. Uh, they, they could also, if they wanted, uh, they could say, oh, they could order new elections like they did in North Carolina. Uh, but in North Carolina, that was only in a limited number of districts. So we don't know if they would ever uh, do a, a total order of uh, new elections. At the end of our program, we've gone over time. We thank you for your patience. We certainly appreciate and thank uh, our presenters for the time and the sharing of their experiences and their knowledge. And uh, we want to give them another hand, please. <laughs> we, we, we thank you, audience, for coming and participating. We look forward to seeing you again uh, next month on the fourth Saturday. We'll be right here. And uh, 
But without any further ado, Mr. Sam Johnson. An MCM production.